Welcome and thank you all for coming. It is great to see such a large audience. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ana Cavadado, Professor of Chemistry at Eastern Oregon University. Um, if I were to describe all of the achievements and accolades uh, that she has received, we wouldn't have time for her talk. <laughs> but I do want to give a little bit of a biography here. Uh, she received her PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Bari in India. And prior to coming to <laughs> EOU, she studied at and worked at the University of Washington, the University of Memphis, the University of Tennessee Medical School, and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, she arrived at EOU in 1992, meaning this is her 30th year here. Um, she has received numerous outreach and uh, research and educational grants, including from the National Science Foundation, the USDA, the Murdoch Charitable Trust, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla, and the Western Re Region Agricultural Center. Uh, she's also been a mentor for the award-winning EOU Chemistry Club for almost 20 years. And her presentation today is on her most recent work, Microfluids and DNA-Based Nanosensors for Bacterial Detection. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Steve. And thank you everybody for being here. It's a real pleasure to see so many people interested in biosensing and <laughs> microfluidics. Uh, and there will not be a test at the end. <laughs> okay, so just to clarify, I'm originally from Italy. Um, so that's where I received uh, my degree, but anyway, <laughs> just a, a minor <laughs> detail. So um, it can, if I can have the slides. Oh, click it once. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. So I am going to talk today about um, the, uh, what I learned uh, during my uh, sabbatical year. So in 2020, I was uh, very fortunate to receive a uh, sabbatical leave from the university and spend uh, some time on the campus of Colorado State University um, where under uh, Professor Chuck Henry, who is actually known worldwide for his pioneer work in microfluidics. Uh, um, I actually was in a research building, so I wasn't uh, uh, particularly affected uh, by the pandemic. Uh, the uh, chemistry department uh, has a specific research building uh, uh, just uh, for graduate research. Uh, and there were very few people around, so I didn't have to worry about distancing myself or, you know, so it was, it was a uh, really n nicely conducive type of environment uh, for this work. And also what worked uh, really well for me uh, in making the most of my sabbatical in terms of uh, then transferring uh, whatever I learned uh, to my students was that I went uh, back and forth uh, from uh, Colorado State uh, here. So I spent some time in Colorado and then I came here and I uh, taught that whatever I had just learned to my students so they were able to implement it and back and forth. Uh, and so that really allowed uh, to move forward with this project uh, a lot faster uh, than if I had just uh, stayed uh, the whole time there. Uh, because there is so much, and, and I have some props uh, here, and I'll share with you, maybe mm, I'll pass them some uh, around, or you guys can come over and look at them, but just to kind of understand more about the fabrication aspect involved, which in reality is very simple, at least uh, at the stage that I um, uh, decided to, uh, intro to use for the purpose of introducing this concept uh, at EOU. So anyway, um, in the, I made a little bit of an outline just to, to kind of give it the idea for the, the scope of this presentation. So first of all, um, I'd, I'll like share with you why I'm so interested in microfluidics and what microfluidics is all about, and uh, also introduce uh, some uh, simple example of uh, paper based and electrochemically based uh, microfluidic devices, uh, which are the ones that we are currently using here. And also put it in perspective of how the sensor development uh, is really an outcome of a long-term uh, interest that I personally have in um, uh, medical diagnostic and, and biosensing, which I have mostly applied to uh, my career to fish disease. So I'll talk about bacterial kidney disease in salmon, which is really the target of um, 
of the, the biosensor development uh, and the uh, type of sensing uh, that I use, uh, which is based on artificial DNA. So those are the aptamers. Uh, and, and describe a little bit the electrochemical sensor. We are ob obviously in the initial stages of this uh, sensor, but I'll share with you what we have uh, uh, accomplished so far. And then another side project uh, from uh, my experience at CSU is that I uh, came across some papers where they were actually using uh, laser printed, or they were describing laser printed devices. So I'll, I'll eventually show you some of these really simple devices that one can print uh, using a common printer on filter paper to make a, um, a little device to run chemical reactions, uh, colorometric uh, reaction. In fact, I was able to introduce these concepts uh, in my analytical chemistry lab uh, this fall. So it was that fast, uh, um, the uh, ability to introduce these concepts. So why, my, and why microfluidics and why am I interested in microfluidics? So I am an analytical chemist by training. And analytical chemistry is uh, nowadays defined as measurement science. So analytical chemists measure things, characterize matter, uh, measure t from larger bulk properties to teeny tiny quantities. So if you, you may or may have not ever been in our uh, instrumental lab, but a typical analytical lab is equipped with benchtop instrumentation. We have a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer that takes an entire room. And even the smaller instruments like uh, the liquid chromatograph, gas chromatograph, wind mass spectrometer, they all take space on a bench and they require very, um, you know, train the personnel to use them. It's not that anybody can just walk and use that kind of equipment. But in the last uh, 20 or so years, there has been a huge push in the world of analytical chemistry to uh, min miniaturize things. So you can think of an analytical chemist as someone that develops or improves an existing equipment. Well, now everything is moving to be very, very small including the analysis themselves. So instead of using beakers and flasks and things like that, you can use very, very small devices uh, uh, with micro channels so that can be as small as, oops, uh, as the um, diameter of it, like a human hair, that small. Not all of them are that much, that's many are larger than that, but just to kind of give you the idea. So there is a large push towards microfluidics because you can use a much smaller volumes. You don't create so much waste in running these reactions. Um, you uh, um, can also run a lot of multiple analysis at the same time. So think about uh, this teeny tiny amount, so like a drop or, or even a tenth of a drop uh, that allows you to operate and, and and actually get some quantitative uh, measurements. Uh, so here are some examples, you know, of what these devices, some are really complicated than, than others, but uh, it, they also mostly operate by diffusion or capillary action. Some also use pumps, but imagine these little uh, channels where things can flow and they can react and you can get a chemical reaction at that scale, like at the microliter scale or the nanoliter scale. So that's uh, the whole uh, push for the lab on a chip, which is not a, a real uh, immediate uh, co uh, novel concept. I mean, the idea of a lab on a chip has been around uh, probably for 20, 30 years, but it's the whole push of taking what in a lab would be normally, which we still do, it's not that it's gone. We still operate this way with multiple equipment that might take some, some time uh, to, you know, to get some results to where now you can put something on a little chip and it can be as complicated as this device that is over here uh, and get results uh, in just a few minutes or a few seconds. Some microfluidic devices you're probably very familiar with. Maybe some of you may have used a pregnancy test 
or more recently, a COVID test. So those are examples of uh, lateral flow microfluidic devices where you put a drop of something, like in the COVID test that you swipe your nose or the, the your throat, and then you mix it with something, and then you put a drop in there, and then you can literally see the fluid move laterally. And so then you use a colorimetric approach to the analysis uh, in, in colorimetric means that you have a band of some color that appears, uh, like in the COVID test that I have from my health, uh, there is like a little red line that shows a control, and then you would have a red line if you had a positive, another red line if you had a positive test. Those are examples of microfluidic devices that are already commercialized and widely used by, by many, many people. Um, so the ones that I learned uh, in co I have to premise this uh, that I knew nothing about microfluidics other than what I had read you know, in, in papers, but I really didn't know anything about how you go about making these devices. So that was the, the focus for me to learn uh, literally the fabrication of these devices. And some can be done, uh, a very simple, um, one that I had my students do just to, to get the concept is that you can do a, make a microfluidic device with a crayon. So you can take a piece of filter paper and you can just uh, draw uh, around with a crayon and then you can melt the wax. That creates a, what's called a hydrophobic boundary. Hydrophobic means that it will not let the, the water through. Uh, or a liquid through, and so now you have wells, so like uh, here I, we put some red food color and green food color, uh, just uh, to get the idea of how you can construct uh, these uh, paper uh, um, devices uh, that then have all these, so these, all these black are boundaries in some fashion. The ones that they had in Colorado, though, they were mostly thermoplastic, uh, and that sounds fancy, but it was just uh, like uh, based on uh, transparencies or pieces of nitrocellulose or stuff like that that are very, you know, like uh, something like this. In fact, um, a, uh, like a transparency is an example. Um, that device uh, looks like this. This is the uh, one uh, the example of a device that they were, and we can probably if people are interested, then circulate and look at it. So they had, um, I have an, I, a little movie here. I don't know whether it will run or not, but um, it shows, let's see. Yeah, right here. So this, div this microfluidic device is just a, a um, you can see the channel, it's not very clear, but you can put a drop of something. And in those pads that are, yellow and blue, there is just food color there as a demonstration, but you can immobilize all kinds of reagents. And so if I move this a little bit faster, because you don't want to wait six minutes for that to complete, you can see how those bands are you know, moving. And they are actually wicked by a piece of paper. So this the white part that you see over there. That's just a piece of paper that is, um, uh, pulling uh, the liquids through. So you can see how they react. And let me just uh, put, bring it to completion. So you can see how they move and they react and they mix. Um, so that's the concept of these devices um, being utilized for all kinds of different uh, chemical reaction in a very sim simple uh, approach. Now, when I went to CSU, my idea was with bring, considering uh, that I was there because I wanted to develop a sensor, I had in mind uh, to um, develop a colorimetric sensor, much like uh, the COVID test, where you get some color that shows up and you can get, okay, say, okay, I can find the bacterium or I cannot find the bacterium. But they convinced me to go another route. So they convinced me to actually choose an electrochemical detection scheme because electrochemistry, which is based on 
like exchange of electrons uh, during a reaction, is actually a lot more sensitive uh, compared uh, to um, a colorimetric approach. So I was very fortunate. I applied for a Badgley fund in the midst of my sabbatical, and I got this really spiffy thing that it's called the pound cents. So this is a potentiostat. You're looking at about eight thousand uh, dollars, and it allows to do all kind of different measurements. Uh, so here are the prongs that I uh, can attach to the to the. Um, uh, electrode, as I will show you in, in a moment. Uh, so it's, uh, it, I, I went uh, this route, and I'll come back to this. So to put my, my whole sabbatical in perspective, I needed to talk a little bit more about mm, the, the research that I have been doing. So some of you may have heard the, the keynote address from uh, uh, Brady Lehman and, and Lance Hatch, who are sitting right there. And I have to admit that I use some of their slides, but I am very proud of that because I think that, I, that if a professor can use the material developed by their students, then they've done a good job. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, so for many years, I've been, in, as I said, that the, the, my premises was that I've been uh, interested in diagnostic tools. And in fact, I worked with near infrared spectroscopy for quite a few years to develop non-invasive methods of analysis to detect disease in fish. And that didn't work very well with bacterial kidney disease because by the time I could detect that the fish had the bacterium, you know, the infection, the fish had deteriorated so much that it, was, it wasn't an early detection. So that's the idea of trying to develop a sensor for early detection. So bacterial kidney disease is um, caused by the rainy bacterium salmoninarum. It's a, it's a bacterium, uh, and you can see it affects the fish uh, in, you know, in a, uh, not a pretty way, let's say. Um, and it can, can actually be um, very damaging, uh, particularly like in hatcheries or in an aquaculture facility where you have a lot of fish in a runway. So if there is an outbreak of the disease, uh, then that disease will transmit very quickly. It can also transmit uh, through the eggs uh, to the to the uh, the juvenile to the to the, uh, the, the into the eggs, but also horizontally, like uh, it can spread in water and cause. Uh, further spreading of the disease. So it's difficult to prevent and control this disease because the RS tends to um, develop uh, resistance to antibiotics. And typically in hatcheries, a fish is treated with antibiotics, but um, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's an issue, and it's an issue worldwide. So one of the interesting features of this bacterium is that it produces an extracellular protein that is called a major soluble antigen, or a P57, that um, is involved in the virulence of the bacterium, but also sheds into the water. So, um, it, and also the MSA is a a target that is currently used for the detection of the bacterium. So a typical way, and this is done, for example, in the pathology lab in Badgley Hall, in the ODFNW uh, lab, they use uh, what's called the ELISA, this test over here, which is a antigen-antibody type of test. And that requires, you know, in, involved equipment and skilled personnel. There are some others uh, that um, you might have heard. That you may now everybody knows PCR testing because of COVID. PCR is polymerase chain reaction. It's a way to um, amplify the uh, DNA. So that's another way of finding, you know, traces of DNA of the RS directly, even in the kidney tissues or in the ovarian fluids of fish, but none of these techniques can really be quickly implemented like a point of care, like directly in the, say, in a hatchery environment. 
So that's where, that's where all of this stands, or where my idea of developing a sensor stands from. So the idea is to develop a, a sensor that can actually be used for constant detection for in water and potentially also in uh, fish tissues or, uh, or other bodily fluids. And um, as I was thinking about all this, uh, I came across presentations at national meeting where people were using artificial DNA called aptamers uh, for uh, uh, the interaction uh, or for as, uh, antennas, let's say, for the sensor where the aptamer interacts with a specific target. So the, uh, the obvious target for RS is this extracellular protein MSA. So I um, posed to try to find aptamers that specifically bind to that target protein. So unli unlike our genomic DNA, which contains millions or billions of base pairs, these aptamers are very small. So each one of these little circles uh, shows one of the, um, the bases, uh, the base pairs used in the, in the uh, or that are part of the structure. And these aptamers have the ability to assume three-dimensional, um, like a three-dimensional uh, structure that then fits uh, like a key in a lock. Imagine a key in a lock, so you have a very specific uh, uh, aptamer that binds to your target. But it's not very easy to find them. <laughs> so I, I had to set up a, a, uh, an entire method that is called the CELEX, and you can read the acronym over here. Uh, I'm not gonna say it, it's, it's uh, too much. But anyway, this is an iterative uh, process where you start uh, from a very large pool of aptamers, uh, and you can just uh, buy that. Uh, you buy, you order from a company a uh, uh, pool of aptamers. They have like a random region uh, in addition to the, um, uh, the region that are used for the uh, uh, polymerase chain reaction amplification. So the central region is basically a uh, random region of all these base pairs. And then you can expose the aptamer or incubate the aptamer with your target, in my case, uh, the MSA. And then you get rid of this, these strands uh, that you don't uh, really uh, use. And it took me about three years uh, to figure out this process. Uh, so you're not looking at something that happens from one day to the other. It's a lot of uh, trial and error and learning particular learning molecular by improvising myself as a molecular biologist because I am an analytical chemist. So fortunately that I have colleagues like Joe and Sean and John Reinhardt that really pitched. So there, there is part of you guys in all of this because I wouldn't have been able without that support from the biology department to set up something uh, of this extent. So in, as I said, in this, uh, um, cycle here, you incubate, you get rid of the strands that you don't need, and then you put them back into this cycle for multiple cycles uh, until you uh, ob obtain a pool that has a really good affinity with your target. Uh, and we have checkpoints uh, here, like where we use a gel electrophoresis to make sure that we recover the strands of the right size, that we don't over amplify using PCR and things like that. And then um, once we uh, obtain this pool, we have to clone that DNA. So we insert the DNA in a, uh, another host, uh, like uh, another bacterium, uh, like E. coli, specific type of E. coli. And then we were able to uh, grow a lot of these uh, um, uh, sequences in, in the, um, using the cloning uh, uh, part um, until we were able to sequence uh, the, the DNA, that actually obtained uh, the sequence uh, of the, um, the different aptamers. Uh, and you can see some new equipment uh, here that we, uh, the 
we just uh, received in Badgley Hall uh, some new e uh, sequencing equipment, uh, although this study was done on the uh, original uh, equipment uh, that we have there. So that's the cloning, and once you get the cloning, uh, you get this sequencing here. So like uh, here are different uh, sequences. Each one of these letters means a, is a base pair. So we have approximately, so these are all 80 base pair long, uh, uh, actually, the, I'm sorry, that's just the, the random region of the sequence. So these are 40 base pairs. And you can see that there are some, um, uh, uh, um, what, are, what are called the homology, uh, region of homology. So these are very similar pieces uh, of the aptamer that kind of confirms that all these aptamers have a, a similar structure and affinity to the target. Uh, eventually, we chose uh, one specific aptamer. And by the way, we uh, also have a uh, software that uh, we can input uh, the sequence, uh, and then we can get these structures. Uh, so that's what they look like uh, um, once they fold. And one in particular, aptamer D, which is right here, for whatever reason, you know, has the very stable and is able to uh, uh, connect to the, uh, to the, uh, to the target uh, in a very tight type of bond. In fact, another uh, important characterization of these aptamers uh, is to calculate how tight the bond is. And we, did not, we do not have the equipment uh, um, that it's uh, typically used for this type of assays. So we were able, which took another couple of years, <laughs> uh, we were able to develop a, 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 a quantitative PCR test and eventually got to calculate the constant, uh, um, the dissociation constant for our aptamer, which is incredibly small. So th that number here, this uh, three uh, times, oops, uh, three uh, nanomolar means that it's in a very, very small amount of aptamer that is not binding. So like in, in the, most of the aptamer is bound to our target. That's what that uh, number means. So what that means is that we were able to identify a sequence uh, that we can actually use as an antenna for our uh, uh, biosensor development. So the, the aptamer is basically at the heart of the sensing uh, that goes on. So that's where I my, my uh, sabbatical come into place. So I went to Colorado, and they convinced me that I had to use electrochemistry. So I said, OK, I will learn how to do this. Uh, and so that's the, uh, if you see the fabrication of these electrodes, and I can pass this around if you want to take a look at them, it's again very simple. And here is one that is not used, uh, so just uh, to give, give a sense. Um, so actually, all it takes uh, is a transparency that has this uh, shape of the electrode. And then um, we put this transparency on top of another transparency, and then use carbon ink and graphite to make a paste. We put it on the transparency, and then we use a squeegee like this, like if you were painting something, and we make a huge mess in the lab, but we just go back and forth. Lance over there is a pro. Like it took me multiple trials, to say the least, uh, to get something, and he tried the first time, and he did it perfectly. So I don't know, but uh, that's, that's Lance for you. So anyway, we <laughs> once you take uh, this, you know, the stencil out, uh, you're basically left uh, with all these electrodes. Uh, and so it's a very cheap and simple fabrication uh, way where now the electrodes are basically on a transparency that you can cut, and the, um, that's exactly the same electrodes that are going around. Um, so they, there is this, this circle here is the most important part because that's where we have make the reaction. So um, the wells are made with this uh, sticky 
uh, paper that is la la again laser cut into these little bitty squares with a hole and then we can apply glue that on top, uh, we peel it off uh, and it makes the electrode with the little well in the center. So that's the fabrication aspect uh, of the electrode. So it's, it's really simple and incredibly cheap. Um, so the idea in the sensor development uh, is that um, we, so if, you go, if we go back, uh, this circle over here is where we actually conducted the sensing part. The other parts are the electrodes that um, needed to complete a three electrode system for our measuring a device that I have over here. So we imagine now that this uh, circle over here is the bare electrode. We use what's called a redox reporter. We use something like a, the ferroferricyanide system uh, that exchanges uh, electrons uh, back and forth. Uh, and we use it as a way to measure the changes in current uh, that happen on the electrode due to the electrode modification. So we, um, we are able to uh, attach the aptamer chemically to the surface of the electrode uh, with a number of chemical modifications. So we mobilize the aptamer on the electrode. We take measurements uh, to characterize the electrode prior to exposing the electrode to the target protein. And then we measure again that uh, once we float the, the protein, we, we put the protein uh, or apply the protein to the well, we measure the current again. So you can see here uh, some preliminary, uh, these are called the voltammograms. So we don't have to go in the detail of all of this, uh, but it's, uh, it's enough to say that what we see is this is say the electrode that has been, um, this is the electrode modified with the aptamer or the, the uh, current that is registered on that electrode. And then as we apply the protein, we see a change in the current and even in a change in the characterization of the electrode. The electrode becomes more irreversible um, compared to this situation over here. So obviously we are seeing uh, changes and we are able to measure changes to the extent that we can actually calibrate uh, this system. So we, we uh, measure the peak current uh, uh, out of the voltammograms and then we plot it versus the concentration of the protein and we can see changes. Of course, uh, this is you know, just a proof of concept. So if we are not ready to go out there and sell this, <laughs> this sensor, but it's a, it's a uh, uh, um, proof of concept in the right direction. And in order to commercialize something like this, uh, there is a lot of work uh, that would have to go into it. Uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, we would have to make sure that the electrode surfaces are very reproducible and stable over time. So ultimately, you know, trying to do this uh, with a squeegee is something that works well in a proof of concept, uh, but if we were to commercialize, most likely this would have to be a process, an industrial process that would uh, um, uh, make sure that the thickness of the carbon ink, uh, that the, the shape of the electrode is extremely consistent because the current uh, measure on an electrode also depends on the electrode surface. So if you change the circle, everything is gonna change. So those are very important considerations. And also stability of the electrode over time. So I actually did a whole bunch of studies while I was there trying to see if it was better to freeze them or put them in the refrigerator or leave them at room ambient. So that, that it's a whole other uh, type of study that needs to be conducted to make sure that these would really withstand. So in other words, when you buy a pregnancy test or a COVID test, you wanna make sure if you notice there is an expiration date because they can only guarantee that the chemicals that are immobilized on the, on the surface uh, are only gonna last uh, so long and then it's gonna expire. 
uh, obviously also having a robust calibration and in the range of concentrations that would be found in, in water samples. Uh, so that's something that we needed to figure out. I mean, are we in the range most likely to really apply this technology? You would want to um, probably take some water and concentrate, concentrate it to where the uh, concentration of the uh, MSA protein would be within a workable range that the sensor can detect. Now, the aptoners are very specific to begin with. Uh, they are by nature, but you still want to, you would want to make sure that the aptamer is not going to bind to other proteins uh, that would be similar to the MSA that potentially could be found in uh, uh, water, say, in a hatchery or in an aquaculture uh, facility. So when you develop a sensor, it's very important that the sensor be very specific so that it only finds the target that you're looking for. So you don't want a false positive, neither you want a false negative. So these are very important considerations. They were doing all kinds of studies about that particular aspect of the COVID uh, uh, microfluidic sensor that they were developing in Colorado, making sure that they wouldn't have those false positive or false negative. Uh, and of course, uh, they, you know, it th would have to be something very different uh, from this because uh, this is a $8,000 uh, potential stat. So it would have to be scaled down maybe to something like a little box uh, that could, where you would insert the electrode and do the measurement, uh, but much uh, cheaper than, than something like this uh, that has a br much broader application in a chemistry lab. So it would have to be something that is simple for somebody that is untrained. Uh, you know, you, here we are looking at all kinds of ramification of electrochemistry. Somebody in a hatchery wouldn't know anything about that. So it would have to be much like uh, we go and apply the drop of saliva on the COVID test and off we go. We don't know, you know what's on that stick. We just look at the response. That, that's how uh, this would work. Uh, for a real application, and it would have to be cost effective. So um, I may be running out of time, maybe we have a few more minutes, but I wanted to share with you that in addition to the biosensor, I had this side project that actually became really fun for me um, about paper-based uh, microfluidic devices. Uh, so in the typical way that um, these devices are done is with wax. So this is, instead of using a transparency, you can use filter paper. So this is an example of little device. Each one of these is one device. Uh, and you would cut it if you wanted to, do, to have each individual one. Um, but these are uh, printed with a wax printer. And wax printers are going out of style <laughs> out of production. So they, it's very difficult to find them. So I came across these papers where people were actually printing using a laser printer and then um, baking the, the on, so the, uh, the, much like this. So we can show these around. <laughs> I'm hands on, you can tell. <laughs> and also, I mean, we can pass uh, these around. These are, uh, these are example of the little microfluidic devices that my students put together uh, this past fall. Uh, the pink one is on nickel and the blue one is on iron. So you can feel free to pass them around. So anyway, um, we made uh, these um, devices uh, um, just printing with a laser printer. And this is, I give credit to uh, Brady <laughs> for making this uh, slide over here that kind of gives you the idea of how you would use this uh, for, say, a point of care or an environmental application. So you have these little devices with the wells. So the, the, the printer um, prints the black part, but the printer material, the toner of a printer, is actually polyester. So when you bake this at 170 degrees, like you're make, making a cookie, uh, you, you end up uh, melting, much like you would melt uh, the wax, uh, you melt uh, the toner 
through the filter paper, and then we put a piece of uh, tape in the back uh, to protect it. Uh, and now these become microfluidic uh, channels uh, where you can just uh, immobilize a reagent uh, and then you put your sample and these are colorimetric in nature. So you're, you're looking at the development of a, a color. So this is an example with iron. Oops. Um, this is an example with iron. We apply um, the reagent, which is the ferrocyanide, and then we, uh, this is done with uh, standards. We literally build a calibration on our uh, little device so that if we have a, a sample that we wish to analyze for that particular um, metal or whatever else, we can look at the intensity of the color and, and actually calculate the concentration. So we take, you can take a picture with uh, the cell phone of the device, and then you put it into this uh, free program that is called the ImageJ, and ImageJ converts uh, the color scheme into a gray area that in, uh, basically gives you a number that you can plot against the different concentrations of the analyte and you get a calibration. So you can semi, I wouldn't say super quantitatively, but semi quantitatively uh, actually uh, uh, determining uh, the analyte. As I said, we tried this um, in, our, in the analytical lab with um, um, iron and nickel. The iron is the one that gives the blue color and the nickel gives the pink color. And over here, you can see some images that uh, Dr. Sean Kane helped us um, obtain on uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, scanning electron microscope that he has in his lab. So we put the filter paper in there and you can see the fibers of the filter paper. And then we applied, so we printed, so all those little droplets, uh, that's the toner. That's what the toner looks like uh, under a microscope. So they're teeny tiny droplets uh, of, we don't know exactly what it is, uh, but it's mostly polyester. They are covered by patents, uh, but it's mostly polyester. So it, uh, it once it melts uh, through, it literally forms these boundaries over here, uh, these hydrophobic boundaries, uh, which are basically this black part uh, all around. And so then it, it, does, it keeps it contained, so you have like a, like a channel. And in fact, I even had a little assessment there to see how the students uh, received uh, this lab. So all I love to teach my labs uh, as a inquiry-based uh, type of uh, you know, research, or like a little research project. So this was a way for me to introduce this really in interesting concept of microfluidic, which is the, um, well, it's the present and the future of a lot of diagnostic tools. So, so it's a great topic to introduce in the, in the classroom. It's really simple, it's, you know, it's not difficult to comprehend, and uh, I think in general was uh, well received by uh, the students. So in conclusion, I had a great time in my sabbatical. I worked a lot, a lot of those experiments that I did with the electrodes, sometimes I was there until midnight. Uh, it was because uh, there weren't that many people around that they could help me. So it was just me and myself and all these electrodes and all this stuff going on. So lots and lots of work, but it was really fun. I did take a trip, one trip from uh, Fort Collins to Durango to visit a friend of mine. So you see me there very audaciously <laughs> rafting the Animas River. I, I always talk too much, so I don't know. I must have said something that I really didn't, wasn't afraid of the water. Guess what? They put me <laughs> right in the front. It was okay, but I wasn't, it was really fun. So, and I said it was a very productive year. We uh, were able to publish all the work that we did on the aftermers uh, um, and also um, the, uh, my research students attended the national meeting in San Diego. So there is Lance and Brady with their poster on the electrochemical sensor and uh, Crystal Atwood uh, was a uh, leader in the uh, microfluidic uh, study. 
So, and then I did a lot of other stuff, but we are out of time. So I think that with that, I'd like uh, to thank, first of all, Chuck Henry. Uh, he was very gracious to let me be uh, in his lab, and I very much enjoyed working with the graduate students. Uh, so you can see uh, Kate and Isabel. Was, uh, Isabel is, was from, uh, is from France. Jeremy Link, uh, who happens, uh, Sarah Ludi went to church with him, so what a small world. Sarah Ludi is one of the, our chemistry, but also math majors, uh, so um, we had uh, that connection. And then my colleagues in the uh, biology department, uh, including Sean, Sean, your name is not up there, but thank you for all the help with the SCM. And uh, Sally G, too, in the ODFNW, a lot of the stuff that I learned about the b bacterial kidney disease and the uh, uh, major soluble antigen protein uh, came from, um, from very good discussions with her and EOU for supporting my sabbatical and of course all the students that put up with me and all the crazy things that I do. So with that, thank you and I hope I didn't bore you or blow your mind or whatever, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so thank you. Anyone have questions for our speaker? Oh, Richard, oh my gosh. Now I'm scared. <laughs> have you investigated the one on the current potential curve? Have you investigated the potential part as opposed to just the current? Actually, I have, yes. So there is another way you can, you can I, I recently found some papers where they actually look at the change in delta E, so the anodic and cathodic uh, potential, and now that changes uh, because uh, that is a function of the irreversibility of the electrode. Uh, so that, uh, there are some papers that are starting to correlate uh, those delta E changes with changes in concentration. Another thing that I did, which I didn't really mention, is that uh, I also look at capacitance currents instead of paradic cu currents uh, um, by just uh, using like a potassium nitrate instead of the ferriferocyanide reporter and looking at how that capacitance current changes with concentration. So that's another potential scheme uh, that we could use. We just uh, need a bunch of many students working 24 hours a day, and then we can get it all done. <laughs> Brady, you're, uh, you're graduating, huh? <laughs> oh, it, it's Lance's problem uh, next year, yes. Any other questions? Did you look into how reproducible functionalizing the um, sensor area was? Ask Lance. <laughs> and, and I guess what, what method did you use to do that? Yes, we, 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 ha we are currently doing that. Um, I, I did some in Colorado, but very little. So that's a, an aspect. What, what did you do to characterize it? Like, um, so one way to characterize the, elect the, the uh, um, electrode surface uh, is to use the impedance uh, spectroscopy because that's very sensitive uh, to the surface modification. So we have done uh, some of those measurements, uh, but we have to learn more about impedance I spectroscopy. Yeah. Otherwise, we just uh, look at the... Um, like it, how the, for one, the uh, shape of the voltammogram changes. Um, so we will make, you know, like 10 electrodes uh, and then measure the current uh, before and after the modification on each of them mm. to see how reproducible that is. Do you know, is. does anyone use like TGA to analyze the extent As in of functional thermal, thermal gravimet gravimetric analysis. So if you've got um, aftermers I don't know that, but um, binding to the ah. sensor area, I don't know. I, but we don't have that. No, we, we don't have that here, but I yeah. imagine CSU. Oh, no, TGA would. is very much used, especially like in the uh, binding affinity constant yeah. measurements. Uh, yeah, that's very used, uh, but that was not an option for me because we don't really have right, yeah. that technique. Yeah. 
uh, uh, surface um, plasmon resonance, uh, SPR, is another one that is used. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker again.